Welcome to the Deakin Alumni Webinar with Dr. Andrea North Samadic on Gender and Leadership, Myths, Truths and What We Simply Don't Know Yet. Dr. Andrea North Samadic is the Course Director of the Master of Professional Practice in Leadership and a lecturer in the Deakin MBA program. Andrea has taught at universities in Australia and overseas for 16 years and received her PhD in Organisation and Management from the University of New South Wales. Her research expertise is on leadership with a focus on gender and collaborative leadership approaches. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Andrea. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm Dr. Andrea Norsamajic. I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today about uh, gender and leadership. So I did my PhD on women and leadership many moons ago. Um, so it's been a topic interest of mine as well as an area of expertise for quite a few years. And even though there has been a lot of research on this topic, a lot of the questions still remain. Um, we've seen a lot of discussion in recent history around um, gender equity in the workplace and gender equity in general. And the funny thing is, is that a lot of these questions that we have already kind of have answers and we've had answers for a long time. We just may not have known that this is, um, this is the information we have on the topic. So I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to share some of this information with you that um, may not change your mind, but at least will give you some more food for thought. So um, thank you for answering all of the poll questions because these are the big questions that we're going to be talking about today. So the first question we'll be looking at is, do men and women really lead differently? Then we're looking at, are there gender preferences in who we seek to follow? How do gender stereotypes impact on the ways we lead at work? And would having quotas lead to more women in senior positions? So we have some answers to these questions, but the answers may not necessarily be what you think. So I'll, you know, we'll skip to the end and I'll give you the short answers to these particular questions. And then I'll go into a little bit more detail about the information behind them. So um, the short answers. So um, in response to the question, do men and women really lead differently? Well, the answer is partly yes and partly no. There isn't really a clear answer to this. So I'll be talking a little bit in terms of why it isn't as clear cut as men having a leadership style and women having a leadership style and everyone leading according to their you know, biological sex and gender. Um, but I think a more interesting question would be why would men and women lead differently? Because if there are certain criteria for success in an organisation, irrespective of your gender, wouldn't you behave, be behaving according to that norm anyway? Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in the next couple of minutes. The next question is, are there gender preferences in who we seek to follow? Absolutely. Everyone has gender preferences. Uh, the bigger issue is, well, what are the implications of these gender preferences? Because how does that shape in the way that we lead, but also how does that shape who we are as a follower and who we seek to follow? So how do gender stereotypes impact on the way we lead at work? I'm going to talk a little bit about social psychology so you can understand about how these stereotypes um, are necessary because they're just, they help our information processing and help us make sense of the world. Where it becomes problematic is that if we only judge people according to these stereotypes. So I'll be telling you a little bit more about how you have stereotypes basically about everyone and everything. And then you can use that as an opportunity to reflect on whether or not these stereotypes are actually helping or hindering you in the workplace. So the last question, would having quotas lead to more women in senior positions? Again, yes and no. In theory, it should work, but in practice, it really doesn't. And I'll be exploring the reasons why the quota system, even though it has been in existence in many countries, never in Australia though, never in Australia though, and that's an assumption a lot of people have, um, that we have had quotas. We haven't ever had legally enforceable quotas in the way that we think, but it has happened in other countries and it's worked for some of them and not for others. So I'll be talking a little bit more about that. So they're the short answers to your questions. So for those of you that have to run off and grab a sandwich, um, hopefully you'll be able to come back and listen to the recording later. But if you aren't sticking around for the rest, they're the short, answer for the, um, short answers to the questions. But now let's go on with the long answers. So uh, do men and women lead differently? 
So what's actually really interesting about this is that we think men and women lead differently because we associate certain behaviours as masculine or feminine and therefore assume that men are behaving in a masculine way and women are behaving in a more feminine way simply because of our stereotypes and assumptions around you know, biological sex and gender. So even if men and women aren't behaving differently, the way we process their behaviour tends to make us think that, oh, well, they're, you know, they're behaving that way because they're a man or they're behaving that way because they're a woman. So think about, um, there's a very common type of discussion you have around women and confidence, for example, that, you know, women need to be more confident and assertive in the workplace. So generally there are assumptions that a woman may not be as assertive because she is a woman, but she may actually be behaving the same way as a man, but is being treated differently because of it. So um, one person's assertive can be another person's aggressive, as it were. So you can have a male and a female leader behaving in exactly the same way, technically, but we will interpret it as differently. This is why a lot of the differences around ma um, male and female leadership tends to, be me tends to be more pronounced in lab studies because they're in controlled environments. So you tend to you know, behave in more stereotypical ways when you are not being informed by the rest of the world around us. But in practice, what you'll find that there isn't as much research pointing to a distinct male and female style of leadership in the workplace. The main reason for this is that, well, we behave in ways that we're going to be rewarded for. So if you've got certain KPIs and certain performance targets and certain behavioural aspirations, irrespective of your biological sex or gendered behaviour, you're going to be behaving in that way for it to be rewarded. So let's say you have a male and a female banker. Um, they're both going to be rewarded for making a certain amount of money and behaving in a certain way. So both of them are going to behave in that way if they want to be successful in that organisation. So in practice, there isn't really a clear cut male and female style of leadership. What we often attribute to is masculine and feminine behaviours. So masculine behaviour is seen to be, you know, more dominant, more assertive. Female behaviour is seen to be more relational and emotional. So depending on what kind of workplace you work in, you're going to be rewarded for certain masculine or feminine behaviours and irrespective of your biological sex, you're going to behave in that way. If you're working in a not-for-profit organisation where it's important that you are emotionally engaged and that you are having caring um, relationships with the people you work with and your clients and the like, male or female, you're going to be behaving in that relational way. So um, we may have observed women behaving in a certain way in contexts and we may have observed men behaving in a certain way in context. Um, and if that's something you really believe that, male, that men and women are just, you know, biologically biologically different and are always going to behave differently, you're always going to think that way and there's really nothing I can say or do um, to make you change that belief. So if we think about the real beginning of leadership thought, the earliest theories we had were trait theory. So that is the great man theory, that some people are born to leadership, the great leaders are born and not made. But that's the old way of thinking, these traits that you had to be masculine and dominant. Now we actually realise that there's a lot more to the leadership picture and it's about having opportunities. It's about being in the right place in the right time. It's about having a vision. And you can actually learn some of the skills and behaviours of leadership. So it isn't biologically determined whether you are going to be a leader or not, which means that um, male or female, anyone can be a leader. So. Um, I'm sure I haven't changed your mind, but I'm sure I've also <laughs> um, incited a lot of questions that we'll probably have in the Q&A. So maybe we should move on to the next question and we can go back to this topic a little bit later. So are there gender preferences in who we seek to follow? Absolutely. Um, we have preferences for everything. For example, here's my coffee. I like it with skim milk. That's my preference. In the same way that we have preferences in terms of leadership. So these are called our implicit leadership theories. So everyone has in their head their role model of leadership, who they see as a leader and how the construct exists. So for me, the most important attributes for a leader that I seek to follow is someone who is clever, someone who is honest, and someone who is brave. 
they're the three things that I see as important. You may have gendered preferences around this. Now, I don't like to think that I have gender preferences, but once you scratch the surface, I may have gender preferences. Um, I've had experiences with working with both male and female leaders, and I've had great examples of women and negative examples of women, right? Examples of male leaders and negative examples of male leaders. But all of these things have filtered through my idea of who a leader is. Now, let's say that I've only ever had female bosses and I've only ever had negative experiences with female bosses. As a result, my view of leadership is going to be colored by those experiences. So I'll probably have a very narrow and probably negative view of female leaders because of these experiences. So even though we, are, we have certain preferences, they're also shaped by the world around us as well. So the more negative or positive experiences we have with someone of a certain sex, the more that that's going to influence the way in which we approach our, um, our views of gender and leadership. The second point I'd like to make about this is that there's something called the similarity attraction paradigm. So that's just a technical academic, um, academic phrase, so I'll just um, break it down so it's a little bit more simple. So basically, we're attracted to people who are like ourselves. That's basically because it makes it easier for us to interact with someone because we've already got the basic assumptions of who they are and what they like and how they'll behave based upon the fact that we already know ourselves. So if you see a group of people together who have just entered into a room, you'll often find that if they don't know each other, eventually they'll start to segment according to gender or perhaps according to race. Why is that? It's not even necessarily something we do deliberately. I mean, I don't go into a room and say, oh, where are all the other white women? I need to stand by you. But if you are put in a situation where you may feel socially uncomfortable and not too sure who to interact with, you'll naturally gravitate towards people who are like you, purely because we assume we'll have things in common, you'll have more to talk about, and you'll understand them better. And this is one of the reasons why there is talk about diversity in the workplace and why diversity can lead to conflict, because there are misunderstandings. It is common that we misunderstand people who aren't like ourselves, but we owe it to ourselves and the people we work with to take the time to find out more, to make ourselves uncomfortable and seek more information. So if you find yourself always hanging around people who may look like you at work, you may need to make a conscious effort to find and befriend and socialize people who aren't of your same demographic background. Um, I mentioned another, um, I forgot to mention another demographic category and that's age. Now we are seeing because of the aging workforce increasing age discrimination. So we are having a lot of assumptions and stereotypes around age as well. For example, in tech-based industries, there's a natural assumption that people who are younger tend to be more technologically astute. People who are older may be out of touch, um, but there's no evidence to suggest this. And alternatively, there's a lot of millennium bashing in the media, assuming that people who are younger aren't motivated and expect, expect the world quickly. Um, but if you look back, Gen Y had the same criticisms. Gen X had the same criticisms. When the baby boomers came to the fore in the 1950s, they had the same criticisms. So really, we need to check our assumptions and preferences about who we seek to follow, because we may just be making them according to stereotypes. So I'll talk a little bit more about how this happens because it's something you can never stop. Um, everyone has stereotypes about everything really. Um, and what they are is that these are the ways in which we perceive and make sense of the world. So stereotypes are a perceptual shortcut. So there's so much information that we're inundated with on a day-to-day -day basis. For example, we work with lots of different types of people who are acting in very different ways. And, you know, we don't often have the time to get to know the individual deeply and find out who they are as a person. So to alleviate all of this mental processing, what happens is that we have these mental models in our heads that help us make sense of the world and filter the information for us. So, Everyone categorizes individuals based on the limited information that they are provided. The way we perceive the world always has perceptual shortcuts and stereotypes are one of these. 
But because it is a natural part of our mental processing, we can't actually stop this. So if you say, oh, I don't have any stereotypes, you may be telling yourself a little, little fib or two because it's just something we all have. It may, may be a gender stereotype, may be a stereotype around leadership. It may be a stereotype around a profession or an industry or someone of a particular background. So we have these stereotypes, and I keep repeating myself because this, it bears repeating, we can't actually stop them from happening. Um, the reason why they are seen in such a negative way is that if we're always filtering the world through our stereotypes, then we're not actually allowing more information to come through and influence how we perceive the world and as such our behaviour. So because of this, if you're always thinking according to stereotypes, it can lead to inaccuracies and you make assumptions about other people and you can even make assumptions about yourself. You probably have stereotypes about who is, success, who is a successful person in your workplace and you may be judging yourself according to them. You may think, I'm not worthy of that promotion. I could never be a CEO. I could never create my own business because you've got a stereotype of who an entrepreneur is, who a CEO is, who a more successful person is in your organisation, and you're judging yourself by those standards as well. So it's important that you are aware of these things. So how can you actually go about um, addressing them and ensuring that your stereotypes aren't holding you back? Well, I'm glad you asked. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. So, um, stereotypes are a perceptual bias. You can't get rid of it, you just need to mitigate it. How do you mitigate it? First of all, you're already halfway there by acknowledging that stereotyping can occur with very little information. We can base our stereotypes on people and our judgments on people based on the tiniest bit of information. And here's a little example that um, I've shared in class to illustrate that um, my undergraduate degree was in business and I remember my first year of university, my first class, it was Accounting 101. And the lecturer stood up at the front and said, okay, turn to the person next to you. One of you will be here again. This class has a 50% failure rate. And that really set the tone and the rest of the semester was horrible. As a result, I think I may have a natural bias against accounting lecturers or men named Frank who have moustaches, only because that was such a formative experience for me is that now I know that I judge people based on this. I'm a lot open um, and hopefully a lot more collegial with the accounting lecturers here at Deakin as a result. So I'm aware that you know this one experience with an accounting lecture kind of traumatised me a bit and gave me a little bit of a bias against certain types of people. Well, now I know it, um, I can actively try and mitigate it, even though I can't get rid of it. So the next thing you need to do is stay open to new information. By that we mean keep an open mind, try and reserve judgement. It's okay not to have an opinion on things and wait and gain more information. In fact, staying open to new information also requires you to actively seek more information. And there's been a few instances with me in my recent career that I've judged people based on one interaction. Um, and then I've ended up going back and meeting them a second or a third time and realised, wow, I completely got the wrong end of the stick. They may have been having a bad day or I may have been acting in a certain way that made them respond to me in a certain way. So these have actually been really interesting experiences for me because I can go back and realise that I've stereotyped and judged these people based only on one interaction instead of thinking, you know what, maybe I keep an open mind and wait or, you know, wait till they prove me wrong. So the last thing you need to keep in mind is that stereotype, stereotypes rarely apply to a specific individual. It's not that stereotypes are inaccurate, it's just that they are always incomplete. So I'll say that again. It's not that a stereotype may be inaccurate, it's that they are always incomplete. So if you are to think about your stereotype of an academic, um, you may think, you know, someone who wears glasses, someone who reads a lot of books, someone who can be 
boring and hasn't had real world experience. Well, some of these things actually apply to me. I wear glasses. I read books. I can be really boring when I talk about something I'm passionate about, particularly if no one else um, is as passionate about it. Sometimes I'll be in lectures and lectures and I'll start talking about something that I'm really excited about and the students aren't and I'll just keep banging on about it because I'm just that excited about my particular area of expertise. Um, but I have had real world experience. I've worked in banking and finance. I've worked in HR positions and I've worked in operations management. So the stereotype of an academic somewhat applies to me, but it's not the whole picture. It's the same thing with gender stereotypes. There may be a few things that may typify someone's biological sex as equating with your view of men or women, but that doesn't mean that's the whole picture. So even though you may have one or two cues that indicate they may be behaving in what you see, as a stereotypically male or female way, doesn't necessarily mean that that's, you know, they fit the mold entirely. So that's where you need to keep an open mind, seek more information and withhold judgment if you can. So the last topic, would having quotas lead to more women in senior positions? So in theory, yes. So I'll talk a little bit about why quotas um, quotas are a thing that uh, that are used in some organisations and in some countries. I do want to clarify that the, you know some people call them targets versus calling them quotas. That's just massaging language so people aren't scared. So sometimes when I'm in a class, instead of using the word theory because people get freaked out by theories, call it a concept or a framework because it seems softer and more useful. Quota or target, it's essentially the same thing. The difference is, is that in practice, quotas are seen to have a legal basis, whereas targets are more voluntary. But again, it's just massaging the language. So the reason why quotas exist is that it assumes that the system and society is biased. And without deliberate corrective intervention, things will not change on their own. So in terms of gender quotas, it's assumed that unless women are given the opportunity to be in more senior positions, it naturally won't happen on its own for a very long period of time because there are so many stereotypes and biases at play that you need to force change. Now, some people may see this as reverse discrimination, um, and I'll talk a little bit about what that would entail. Um, so in the history of quotas, worldwide, people have never been promoted in, people should never have been promoted into positions for which they are not qualified. There is no law in the world that suggests we are going to promote a less qualified person purely because of their demographic backgrounds. So this is where there's a lot of misperception around quotas because people assume that it's just about forcing people into positions for which they are not qualified. Quotas are actually based on the merit principle. So they would work by the case of, if you had, for gender quotas, a man and a woman applying for the same job, if they are both equally qualified, you would give it to the woman because it's assumed that she's had to work harder to get through the bias system to get there. Also, it's part of the restorative action to gain more gender parity. It's assumed that once you have more people in visible positions, that it will force natural change as well. And representation really does matter. And we're seeing that a lot in the media at the moment in terms of, you know, having TV shows and movies with diverse casts. Representation, representation does matter and we can't be inspired by what we don't see. So if you don't see female leaders or if you don't see uh, Indigenous leaders, if you don't see leaders who are LGBTQI, um, if you are someone who is female, an Indigenous Australian or LGBTQI, that means that you may not think that you can aspire to those things because you can't aspire to something that you don't see. So it has a multiple flow on effects. Um, really, it's also about changing perceptions because, as I said previously, um, the thing is with stereotypes that 
and biases is that they're informed by our experiences. If you've never seen a female leader, if you've never had experience with one, you may just assume that women don't want to be leaders because otherwise, why would they not be around? But if there will be more women in your environment, you would eventually come around to realising that women can be just as effective at leadership than men. So that's one of the reasons why quota laws have existed. And in Australia, we had um, the gender equity legislation first came in in 1984. It was revised in 96 and has um, undergone subsequent revisions since. Uh, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency has put in targets for organisations to aspire to so that they can be considered an employer of choice. However, there have never been quotas in terms of legally mandating that you should have this many women in senior positions or you will be punished as a result. Um, the laws around it are actually a lot stricter for government organisations because you're going for tender and it's assumed that the contractors working for government are representative of the society in which the government exists. So that's one reason why there tends to be a little bit more um, stricter treatment for government-based organisations and contractors. Um, but in the private sector, look, organisations have a way of getting around it. <laughs> um, it's not really strongly enforced, the current uh, legislation anyway, in terms of having gender representation. They set aspirational targets, but if you don't meet them, there's really not that much recourse. Uh, the biggest punishment is being named in parliament, and if you are named, then you can't go for government tender. But in practice, it's actually quite easy to massage these reports and get away with it. And as we've seen with the banking inquiries and the like, um, private sector can get away with quite a lot of, you know, massaging the law and getting around certain rules and restrictions and gender equity legislation is no different. So even if we had the quota legislation, there's a strong chance that organisations would find ways to get around it because we've been finding ways to get around the targets for, you know, 30 years as it stands. Um, but that's not to say that it hasn't had some effect because we are seeing more women in senior positions. We can't really say whether it's directly because of this legislation or not, but overseas we've got stronger examples that we can speak to in terms of gender quotas. So. Um, gender quotas in Europe. So there's been a number of countries. Norway is seen to be one of the leading countries that has had gender quotas for women on boards. Um, there's a great article from The Economist as well that was published earlier this year. It's easy to Google as well um, that looks at gender quotas. And um, what their particular article shows is that even though they have had more women in the, at the board level, that hasn't actually flowed down which is quite interesting because one of the arguments around why target women on boards, because it's assumed that, women, that you'll have more women at the most senior position and as a result, the women will try and help more women throughout the organisation and kind of pull each other up the ladder. Turns out that didn't actually really happen. Um, you've got more women at the board level, but it hasn't really gone down to senior management level. So even if we did have the quotas um, for boards in Australia, it wouldn't necessarily lead to more women at senior positions. And in fact, talking earlier about organisations circumventing the law, in the Norwegian example, um, uh, organisations on the Norwegian Stock Exchange had to comply within a few years or be deregistered. Well, what happened was that a lot of these organisations organisations actually deregistered themselves and went back to being private organisations so that they didn't have to comply with the gender quota laws. So, yeah, organisations have, you know, really creative ways of getting around these things because, you know, private sector organisations don't love regulation. So, you know, let's look more at the Australian context. Um, as I said, we have had progression in terms of uh, the representation of women in organisations. It hasn't been as fast as the regulatory bodies would like. A big issue is pay gap. So even assuming that you have more women within an industry doesn't actually mean that you'll have um, less of a pay gap. The biggest pay gap in favour of men is in finance, and that's actually one of the most feminised industries. You may think, wow, I assume banking is quite masculine. And again, that would be your stereotype that banking is masculine. Actually, there's more women working in banking, um, particularly in the service roles and client, um, less, in the, less in the client facing roles, more in the back office functions, highly feminine 
feminised. Um, but because of this split, this division of labour where you've got more men working in client facing and more women working in service, that's why you generally have that bigger pay gap in finance. Um, other industries where women aren't, um, where there aren't as many women, uh, construction, mining, natural resources and STEM industries, but we are improving that science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So um, talking a little bit more about pay equity, look, even last year, we've got only 58.5% of organisations have a formal policy or formal strategy on remuneration, even though legally they've had to exist since 1984. So it shows that organisations have been, you know, getting away without having a formal strategy to close the pay gap for a long time and no one's actually really gotten in trouble for it. So more regulation doesn't necessarily mean um, greater impact. Talking about female representation, um, the number of female CEOs has improved over time, but not that much. Um, when we are looking at women on boards, that there's only been some increase, and again, in in certain industries. The industries that are more highly feminised, like banking, the public sector, not-for-profit, um, you'll see more women on boards there because of representation um, overall. But female CEOs in Australia, we're still um, you know, going a little bit slower than we'd like. So this is just some of the information, and I'm going to put up a slide in a little bit to show you where you can get more information, because you may be very interested to find out, well, where does your industry sit in terms of pay gap and policies? And there is a lot of data out there, and it turns out, um, unfortunately, a Workplace Gender Equality Agency, this is my message from me to you, you need to get a better publicist, because I don't think people really know that this data is out there and it's really useful. Um, but there's a lot of things we don't actually know. Because organisations can generally get away with not giving the full picture of how they're addressing gender equity, we don't really know what's happening in most organisations. A lot of the reporting is window dressing around what people are doing rather than actually giving meaningful data um, because a lot of organisations have a lot to hide and no industry is immune. Um, talking about gender stereotypes, they can change. As I mentioned, if you expose people to others of different backgrounds, slowly over time, your perception of people who are not like you will change. How long does that take? We don't know. It can very much depend on the individual, but we are working, you know, there's more and more research coming out on um, how long it takes for stereotypes and prototypes to change. For some people, it takes longer than others, but let's just stay hopeful that they can actually change. Um, in terms of the effect of quotas in Australia, you know, I've spoken about how in Norway it's worked at board level but hasn't flowed down. You know, what can we really say about Australia? Well, we don't know because we've never had quotas. We've had targets and we've managed to evade them pretty well. Would we be the same with a quota system? No one can say for certain. Um, I'm saying I'm personally doubtful, but that's my personal opinion and it's not reflective of anything. Um, and also the final point that I want to emphasise, and this is something about research on gender and leadership overall and something that I've got to cop to as well, um, it needs to be more intersectional. So as a white woman, a lot of my research speaks from and to a Caucasian woman's perspective. And I'm very sorry for that and I'm expanding my research repertoire and I'm taking responsibility for that and I hope others do as well. So hopefully... Um, We'll have more research on the critical intersections, particularly gender and race, because we know that the pay disparity between men and women is, you know, quite reasonable. But for women of colour, it's even greater. For women of colour who have children, it's even greater than that. So, you know, a bit of white privilege speaking here. Also, age discrimination. Um, we don't know as much around how age impacts Leadership depends on industry, but also religion as well. So um, there's some great research in this area, but it is far out why it is far outweighed by research that looks at gender and leadership from a very Western white perspective. So there's more work to do. Um, and in terms of you know informing our understanding, um, here's a few suggestions of where you can get some more information. So workplace gender equality agency. The first link there takes you to their general website. The second one, data.wgea.gov.au, that's where you find all of the data about your industry. You can even search and see how your organisation is reporting on the policies and practices. 
So um, the other one, the other great website is the Diversity Council of Australia. This is particularly useful for organisations and yourselves who are looking at um, intersectional issues around diversity, so race, age, religion, um, ethnicity, sexuality, um, abled status and the like. And the last one, um, because a lot of the research on quotas has been around women on boards and some of the um, men and women here in the audience may be interested in learning more about that topic as well as how they can find board positions, that's a great website for you. So that's the short and the long of it in terms of myths, truths and what we don't know yet. Um, I'd love to hear your questions. Thank you so much, Andre. That was a really insightful presentation. Now we'll move over to our questions, thoughts and discussion time. So I'll leave a few moments for you to type in your questions now. Okay, we'll start with our first question. What would you say to a man who asks, what do I have to give up in order to achieve equality in women, for women? Well, um, first of all, if he's saying that, fantastic. Um, hats off to him. Um, and for me, what you would say is that he has to give up being comfortable because change requires growth and growth requires you to be uncomfortable. So that means putting yourself in a position where you're being wrong and being challenged on your ideas, not being the perceived smartest person in the room. So it's really about giving up comfortability going outside of your regular circle of existence and seeking more information, but particularly seeking more information from the groups of people in the world that you seek to understand. And I can talk about my position of white privilege and that, you know, if I wanted to learn more about how to be more racially sensitive, then I'd talk to my, you know, friends and colleagues who are people of colour and say, what do I need to do to change? Um, and then just listen. I think that's really the first step. Um, be uncomfortable and just listen. Thank you so much. Our next question from Serene. When females assert themselves, they are thought to be emotionally charged and out of control, whereas males are seen to be taking charge and in control. How do we, how can we mitigate against this stereotype? Yeah, it's one of those um, great questions, Serene. It's a case of damned if you do, damned if you don't, really, because if you try and be more meek and mild, as it were, then you're taking yourself out of the running for positions where you need to be more dominant. But if you are seen as confident and assertive, you may be seen as a B-I-T-C-H, as it were. Um, so there's really no easy answer because both of them, you're between a rock and a hard place. Um, for the men in the audience, it's a case of knowing that you have these stereotypes and if you are judging someone according, you know, if you're saying a woman is emotional or out of control, are you saying the same things about your male colleagues in total? Um, but as a woman, the best advice I can give in terms of research is to keep putting yourself out there till you no longer care what other people think. A lot of people call me a B-I-T-C-H but I've put myself out there long enough to know who I really am and no longer care about um, these negative opinions. So unfortunately, you've got to develop a thick skin because it's easier for you to develop a thick skin than it is for other people to change their ideas. But surround yourself with similarly confident men and women telling you how awesome you are every step of the way. So for every person that may call you emotional out of control, you've got 10 other people telling you back how amazing you are. Thank you, Andrea. Our next question from Jenny. Do quotas bias the recruitment process? For example, you, um, are you selecting on gender and not the right person for the position? That's a fear, but it's a fear that doesn't actually have a lot of evidence because when we look at um, you know, gender quotas, in Australia we've never really had that as an overall legal system. Organisations can petition to the Human Rights Commission to get exceptions from this though, because it seemed to be illegal to discriminate in favour of women. But for example, the University of Melbourne has just put in a petition to exclusively advertise for female engineering lecturers because they didn't have any female engineering lecturers and they thought that this was one of the reasons why young women weren't going into engineering at Melbourne Uni because they weren't seeing enough of themselves in the academic staff. So most, 99.9% .9 of recruitment um, position, positions being recruited for don't actually have gender targets. For the very minority that there are, they will 
um, give bias to gender. However, they'll never appoint someone who isn't qualified. I mean, I'm a woman, but I don't have an engineering degree, so I can't front up and try and go for that job because, you know, you've still got to be qualified. At the end of the day, we're running a business, everyone's running a business, and doesn't matter how well you fit a certain criterion, if you can't do the job, you're not going to last. Thanks, Andrea. Our next question from Paroma. Hi, Dr. Andrea. Thanks so much for that wonderful session. Here's my question. What, according to you, are the primary gaps that haven't been addressed to help women grow and develop in their professional lives? Also, which are the ones that have been successfully addressed and how have they been successful? That's a great question and it requires a long answer, but I'm going to give you the short version. So, gaps. We don't have enough knowledge about men and masculinity in the workplace. That's something that's coming to the fore now. When we talk about gender and leadership, a lot of the research is done on women and we've been ignoring men. So, we need to ask more questions of men and how they practice leadership and their views towards women in the workplace. Need to hear more of those particular stories. In terms of what we know around what's being successful, I think the research that points out that men and women don't have their own leadership approaches is quite liberating. Because um, I've, I've always grown up, I was a massive tomboy growing up, and I've always seen myself as one of the boys, as it were, and then to you know have the thought, oh no, I have to behave more feminine, for me would have been quite challenging. So I actually like the fact that you know we aren't beholden to our gender stereotypes when it comes to leadership, because it means um, male, female, or other, you can just be you. And as long as you find the right workplace and you know do your job well, then you have you have potential. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Paroma's got a follow-up question. How can we constructively work towards bringing women back to the workforce? Um, women, have take, women who have taken a career break either because of their own choice and or personal circumstances. Another great question. A lot of organisations preach flexible work practices. However, in practice, it's just more preaching. So one of the reasons why a lot of women um, are reluctant to come back to the workplace, it means because flexible work isn't practiced as well as it's preached. One of the reasons is that we need more men to take parent to take their um, paternity leave and for them to use flexible work options. It'll normalize it. Um, I'm a woman without children. I need to use flexible work options more so that it normalizes it for my colleagues who have children so they won't feel disadvantaged. Organisations need to practice what they, what they preach. Your homework for everyone listening is find your flexible work policy in your organisation. Then I want you to go directly to HR and say how many people actually use it and how many men versus women. Because then if there's flexible work policies and it's only being used by women, it's not going to be part of the culture. So that's one big factor there. Um, the other factor is a lot of people aren't... Um, sensitive for career breaks and that's for anything really you can have a career break because of illness or misadventure or you've got um, other care and needs and this is where I'm can be sometimes too critical of HR departments and I'll speak it overall as a profession and from my personal experience particularly when it comes to hiring um, recruiting is very conservative that is we talk about innovation and we talk about you know, challenging our ideas in business, but when it comes to recruiting people into positions, we tend to choose what seem to be the most suitable rather than taking a chance. Um, so rather than just assuming that just because someone's done a job effectively before, doesn't necessarily mean they're gonna perform it effectively in another role. So if you are a HR professional, I think it's a conversation that, and I you know, speak as someone who does, um, who is involved in research in HR as well. We need to sit back and ask ourselves, are we actually taking chances and sufficient risks to diversify our workplace? And diversity in terms of career backgrounds, experiences, um, lifestyle, so diversity isn't just about gender, it's bigger than that, and it is beyond demographic factors as well. However, we do need to get the demographic factors squared up first. Thank you so much, Andrea, and some great advice there for our audience. Our next question from Jyoti. Thanks for the great session. How can women break into the traditional boys club in certain industries? Okay, so particularly if they're male dominated, what you need to find is a male mentor. A lot of the time, and this is why I can be personally critical of female only networking events, those 
Those events are fantastic for social support amongst your female peers who are going through similar struggles. However, to get a leg up, you need to have people in more senior positions in your organization and industry being your champion. They are usually men. So ensure that you have senior male mentors, more than one. Take their advice and they'll take you under their wing, hopefully, to help you out. So that's the best piece of advice I can give you. Thank you. Our next question. How do you think we can best change gendered mindsets in the corporate workspace? Well, we don't have a have an answer for that. Um, ideally, having more diverse people in the workplace will do that. And we need to have greater diversity at junior positions as well. To change corporate mindsets, there is no answer because if there was an answer, I'm damn sure we'd be doing it by now. Um, but as I said, it can change over time. So it is about taking chances um, on people who may come from non-traditional backgrounds, um, male and female, of all different, um, all different diverse categories. But there's no answer to that. There really isn't, and I, I really wish there was, because we could do a lot, a lot of good in the world if there was a clear answer. Thank you. Um, we've got a comment from Ashley. Fantastic presentation. Having worked in many industries over many years, I've said I certainly have a leadership type I prefer, but definitely not a gender preference. I've had fantastic bosses and ment mentors, both female and male, and definitely had had bad ones from both too. Such a great presentation and thanks again. Oh, thanks, Ashley. That's really kind of you. And I think that's a great example, um, as I said before, having male and female mentors um, is key for both men and women. So if you're man in the audience, thank you for joining us and opening um, your ears and minds to this topic because we need more men to help us out with the gender dialogue because it's not something we do on our own. And toxic masculinity is not just an issue for women, it's an issue for men too, which is why we're seeing significant mental health issues for men in and outside of the workplace because the way we're constructing success and appropriate behaviour is a very narrow masculine norm that while no woman can actually conform to, men have a hard time doing it as well. You know, not accepting emotions in the workplace isn't just damaging for women, it's also very damaging for men too. Thank you, Dr. Andrea. And we're almost out of time, so we'll take the last question. Is there a linkage between gender inequality and societies with high power distance? Ooh, that sounds, okay, someone's done their international business unit if they know Hofstede's cultural dimensions. Generally, there is, but one of the cultural dimensions is masculinity and femininity, and that's got a higher correlation. So um, it's less about power distance in terms of culture. So a com country that is high power distance, um, they're more likely to obey who is senior irrespective of gender. But if it's a high power distance country that's also masculine favoured, then you're going to have... Um, a harder issue. But here's the thing, if it's a low power distance country and highly um, highly masculine, that means if you're a female boss, you're going to have a harder time being listened to because culturally people prefer equality and not, you know, obeying and also they would prefer a masculine style of leadership. So um, that actually means in Australia we've got an added challenge because we tend to be more masculine and tend to be low power distance. But um, yeah. I don't want to end on a, on a negative note. I think we need to be positive here because, you know, we're all here and we're learning and we're trying to grow together and we've got wonderful people doing wonderful, wonderful work. We've got great men and women championing, championing gender equality. And the more of you aspire to practice leadership from an ethically and socially responsible way, the better the world will be for men, women and everyone in between. Thank you so much, Dr. Andrea, and what a great wrap-up to such a great presentation. Thanks for all your questions um, to our live attendees here today. We, we definitely had a range of really good questions from you. Um, for those of you who are asking whether the session was recorded, yes, it will be available in the next few weeks, um, available via the Deakin website. Um, if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint presentation slides, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, just email us at deakinalumni at deakin.edu.au. Um, 
For those who haven't joined our social media pages, please do so. We've got a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page, um, and you can keep up to date with upcoming um, alumni events and alumni news. So thanks everyone for joining us today and a very big thank you to um, a presenter, Dr. Andrea Norsamadic, for joining us today. If you still have a question, you can email Andrea um, at her email address displayed on your screen and a recording will be available in the next few weeks. Thanks for joining us today and we hope you can join us again soon. Thanks everyone.